Sheed from London. Zaha was born in Baghdad, attended the American school in Beirut studying mathematics before entering the Architectural Association in London. While at the AA, she was especially uh, inspired working with Rem Kulhas and Elia Zengelis, uh, with whom she later went into uh, professional practice, working with the office of OMA for a year. And uh, in uh, 1979, she o about five years ago, she opened her own practice. And in 1983, won the Hong Kong Peak competition, which uh, really uh, spotlighted her as an emerging uh, young talent. Uh, a few years ago at the AA, they uh, had a uh, retrospective exhibit of her drawings. And uh, last night, uh, Zaha flew to San Francisco to open an exhibit at the Philippe Bonifant Gallery there of her drawings. Uh, which will be up for a month, and, and we're very happy that uh, that exhibit opened it, uh, there and brought her to California, because tonight she's here with us, and I'm very happy to introduce to you Zaha Hadid. Actually, I, I'm blinded by the slides, sorry. Can something have been done about this? I'm still blinded. I, I don't like to talk to kind of a black uh, audience, but uh, anyway, um, I should say that really this works. Many people thought uh, I had emerged from nowhere two years ago to win the peak, which was um, again something which uh, had come uh, out of looking at my navel. But um, the work that really started about nine years ago when I was a student at the AA, and it was not really about um, kind of uh, a frivolous, frivolous activity, but it was really the investigation of modern architecture and uh, the basis of that work kind of stems from the 20th century culture. If you, I could have the first slide, please. And if I can have that light off. Can I have that light off? I still have the light in my face. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said, this work started nine years ago when I was still in my fourth year at the A with Rem Kulhas and Elias and Geddes, uh, arrived at that studio having been with Leo Korea for a year. And uh, that really determined me not to uh, accept that kind of, uh, the only way to proceed is to kind of go backwards. And um, a lot of people thought that I was an Arab and I had no culture. But I always remind them that uh, I am an Iraqi and um, we are the creator of civilization, so I should know better. And uh, so on and so forth. But anyway, I think the interest was really the investigation of modern culture. And it had to do with really uh, the looking not back at um, early movement in, uh, in the 20th century as a way of uh, kind of cribbing these images. I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> Does this mess up your video or is it okay? okay. And, um, but um, if one wants to kind of make a format for a kind of uh, 20th century culture, one has to really examine all these uh, incidents that happened in this uh, century. And what uh, started me off, or what excited me first was, uh, and more obviously, are the Russians. Uh, not because of their uh, kind of uh, imagery, but because in, t in terms of architecture, their whole um, investigation into the program. And I think it is the, one of the most kind of interesting things about the 20th century kind of architecture is the emphasis on the program. In Russia, it just happened to be that um, there was a, a political change which enabled this to happen. and. Um, Somehow that whole uh, kind of uh, optimism in the latter years of the 20th century kind of evaporated. And we found ourselves a few years ago on this uh, kind of uh, uh, plane of uh, sheer uh, pessimism. And um, it was at that moment that um, also I realized that uh, the only way to proceed is to really uh, kind of uh, experiment further, but 
not really looking at your neighbor, but re looking at and examining continuous agriculture. So I will go through these images and I will predominantly concentrate on the peak because um, it's going to take you a while, most probably, to understand some of the drawings. So um, I will concentrate only on that project, but I will show glimpses of the other ones. The whole interest in Malevich was not, again, because uh, of the kind of paintings, but the implication that, uh, in some cases, the injection of suprematism into architecture and the whole notion of kind of this uh, liberation uh, from gravity, uh, really physically and uh, uh, in every uh, possible way, that you kind of uh, break away from all the ties that tie you down in terms of architecture. So the injection of suprematism into architecture happened in, 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 in Russia in a lesser degree uh, by Elisitsky and uh, ultimately by Leonidov, which was um, again aborted like many modern movements in the middle 30s under Stalinism. There's the Lenin Library and the whole evolution of the kind of uh, the new programs uh, in Russia, was, which are kind of the powers of culture. So. Um, and these are kind of really precedents of the work which I eventually kind of uh, based uh, some of the work on. Uh, another palace of culture, Barriero. And it was uh, that ability to kind of uh, combine uh, form formalism with uh, not functionalism but program uh, in, in such a kind of uh, exciting way that uh, I thought that uh, if this was done in the, in the 20s, then surely in the 80s we can even do better. Uh, and um, uh, Leonov, even despite all the hammering he had under Stalin, this is um, the composition for the Ministry of Heavy Industry. Uh, a model done for that uh, building in the New York uh, in a show at the Institute a few years ago, which is now in the possession of the Museum of Art, where every uh, building had a specific uh, uh, program and the way they all read together also was very, uh, this was sitting on the right square. And not only the Russians, but I think also um, a lot of these ideas which um, uh, kind of occurred in, uh, in Europe in the, uh, in the 30s. Hilbezama and Misa and Roa early kind of uh, work. And uh, for some uh, amazing reason, this kind of a tragedy of Europe in a, in a way, is that all their best ideas have never kind of really culminated there. They kind of were always imported into America. And, um, and the same in a way with the Russians, because all the Russians' dreams never kind of happened in Russia, but uh, kind of happened and to a lesser maybe degree uh, in Manhattan. It is not moving. In a sense, I think the Rockefeller Center was really the, uh, the uh, climax of that uh, ability in programming uh, a piece of architecture. Can you move that next one, please? So these are uh, funny slides. The United Nations, which was uh, the breaking of all the kind of the um, basic grid of uh, Manhattan and the whole idea of the kind of uh, the curtain wall, which then uh, became the taboo for modernism. Next, please. Next. And uh, I think it is, in a sense, very uh, sad what had happened is that all these kind of uh, tremendous ideas which were uh, incubated and, and, and somehow uh, uh, flourished uh, elsewhere, uh, they suddenly kind of uh, arrived um, accidentally or deliberately in uh, the United States and, and some parts became kind of the uh, um, the a sign for uh, commercialism and eventually became tabooed as the failure for modern architecture. I mean, in, in, in Europe, in England, uh, all the housing out in the 30s uh, and, the, and after the war was uh, declared as one of the kind of major disasters of the 20th century. So in a sense, the work which I had started uh, a few years ago was really based on the fact that this was not a, a kind of the failure of modern uh, architecture, not a modern movement 
but because all these ideas have never been allowed to flourish and they were uh, kind of uh, at their very early age aborted. If I could have the next carousel, please. Uh, so we are uh, uh, in Hong Kong. This is um, the top of the. Uh, I'm trying to work all these. Uh, yeah, the Hong Kong situation, the kind of in terms of kind of landscape, was that uh, we are uh, as a, supposed to kind of standing in Kowloon, which is a part of the mainland. Uh, there is between you and uh, Hong Kong Island this. Uh, uh, a kind of a span of water <coughs> and then the island itself which is really divided in, in three uh, very definable zones one which is between the mountain and the uh, and the water which is uh, mostly uh, infill land so it's artificial where all the skyscrapers are and then another territory which is called uh, mid levels which is uh, a slope and then between that and the top, there's hardly anything. And um, the, the peak of sight is right below where these antennas are on the top of the mountain. I'm not sure how I can work this out, but um, let me see. Which is over here. And the, the site which was given in the competition was uh, three separate sites. And in a sense, I was quite lucky that I had been to Hong Kong uh, two years before, and I had a very um, kind of a not an idea, but a feeling that uh, about the size, so I knew it, in a sense. Sorry, can we go? Next, please. So this is looking at the top of the peak and looking towards uh, Hong Kong itself. And this is the same uh, view looking from Kowloon uh, towards uh, Hong Kong Island and this is at the top one of the very early sketches of the scheme. And um, a lot of people, when they did the, this competition, first accepted the rules which were set up, and also they uh, immediately thought of kind of putting towers on the peak. And uh, having visited the site, I thought that one of the kind of clearest uh, things that you could not, there's no uh, reason to put a, a high rise on the, uh, on the peak uh, itself because it's, the view is not obstructed, but to slice the mountain like a kind of a knife uh, cutting through it. So these are some of the very early sketches showing how the building really uh, cut through the mountain. And uh, eventually this kind of um, consistent kind of hammering on the mountain implied that the mountain would have to be uh, altered. So the mountain eventually became excavated and the building kind of uh, slid through it. Uh, the landscape. I uh, keep on believing that uh, the landscape in Hong Kong is rugged. I know it's green, but uh, there's a joke which only one person will understand this audience, which is, I don't like nature. And, um, and the fact that is the Hong Kong mountain is actually was rugged till a British uh, went there and sprinkled it and it's shrub now. So these are, again, some of the very early sketches that as you uh, remove the earth from the mountain to uh, replace it by an architecture, you have to link it to the, to the um, rest of the mountain. So this, the, the one of the first things which this uh, new ramp, which is, um, has to be implied. The granite which is blasted from the mountain uh, eventually will become polished and clads parts of the building, which I will always refer to as the uh, man-made mountain. 
And this is really one of the first uh, sketches uh, showing how these, um, as the earth was removed, that these um, plates uh, at the lower part of the scheme and uh, kind of beams, uh, like uh, geology, replace the earth which is taken. So as you take the earth, you replace it by a kind of a modern geology. <coughs> Some of the elements of the peak, and I will always go back to certain drawings because it's difficult maybe to understand them. The top consists of basically uh, four beams. Uh, the, the lowest two, which are much more basic, and they are constructed in a kind of uh, uh, in a m much uh, simpler way than the rest. Then there is a, a, a lab pool, which is uh, rests above them. And this is, I think, for me anyhow, the most important part of the scheme, which is the uh, kind of a new urban space, which is a void. And the top are two, uh, two uh, kind of uh, living beams of accommodation, which are penthouses separated by a kind of a street in the air. And this is what connects them to the rest of the land. So these are fragments of these um, uh, elements. And this is, um, again, the drawings are not always illustrations, but they are really drawings to tell the story of certain projects. So this shows kind of the Hong Kong skyline with Kowloon and the implication that the water could also uh, be invaded by, uh, by programs, so there could be uh, various uh, things uh, which are kind of floating on it. And also that the building itself, the program of the peak, is not seen as a kind of a, a, a country club uh, removed from the city, but it has a direct link to the city in the sense that it has a metropolitan program. So it has a direct link to kind of the density of Hong Kong. And um, so in a sense, the penthouses which appear on the, on the, on the peak have a, in a way, relate to penthouses which could a appear in any city which is, has a metropolitan quality. So this is kind of um, elements of the peak which are inserted into kind of dense urban conditions, which is in Hong Kong. And uh, like uh, the, the kind of the work of uh, the early modernists, I will go through some of the work which I had done earlier in my, um, uh, this is a project which was done uh, when I was a student, which is uh, one of the first kind of exploration of the uh, Russian avant-garde, which was a Malevich hotel on the Thames. Again, uh, the brief was given was the Malevich tectonic and uh, the idea that it has to be invaded by a program. Uh, and this was uh, then has to be given aside. The site was given as a kind of a bridge on the Thames, and then it was invaded horizontally by a, a layers, which is uh, seven years later very similar to the, the, to the peak brief, which was a series kind of, uh, of living accommodation and, um, uh, and, and a kind of cultural club and above our um, more permanent residential accommodation. A uh, uh, study for the one of the elevations. This was done in my fourth year at the AA, which was about nine years ago. Uh, in my fifth year, this was a project which was the museum for the 19th century, which was um, on the same site, which was given as a bridge. For those who would know London, maybe it's familiar, but a Charing Cross station uh, was was going to be redundant. Uh, this is a very important part of uh, London, which is the only, and it says one of the uh, densest uh, parts of uh, London. Over here is the Strand, Charing Cross Station over here, which we could uh, use as a kind of a shed. And this is the embankment, the river. And uh, in a sense, this is kind of the only flirtation on the part of the British with modern architecture, which is the Royal Festival Hall, the, the kind of uh, land of uh, uh, the Festival of Britain. And so the museum was um, to celebrate the 19th century. So it starts in the 19th century and collapses on the footsteps of the 20th century and is uh, a beam of uh, a hotel which uh, spans two buildings uh, rests above it. This is uh, the entry to the museum. The hotel, which is uh, its roof, is always exposed. And where the museum and the hotel, um, in a sense, interlock is the, where the void is, which is a constant over the station. This is the entrance, a permanent shadow over the, the vaults below. And this was one, the, one, really one of the first projects which I did on my own after I left the uh, Office of uh, Metropolitan Architecture. In between there was uh, another scheme. 
But um, this was really the first time that I actually decided to explore the idea of kind of, uh, of um, what people called uh, hysterics, but um, I call dynamics. And um, really, and, and also the understanding of how to control it. So this was the uh, house for the Irish Prime Ministers uh, in uh, the, the Taoiseach's house. And this was uh, supposed to be um, a, a house for the dignitaries, which is a, a rest house. And this is his own house. These are very early sketches. So this was an existing walled garden. And within this garden, uh, the elements of the house are separated and um, are within the courtyard. A later kind of uh, composite plan. This is not a true plan. This is a plan of many levels on the same plane. So um, as I said, some of the drawings are not really illustrations, nor they are true plans, but they are composite of many levels of the same project. So this has the ground level, the first, the second level all in one. So this shows the walled garden, and the, the scheme is basically um, the state guest house is maintained within the walled garden, which is existing, so because it's never used, uh, rarely used. The residential suite is the only thing which is really uh, hovers above the walled garden, the secondary suite, and this is a communal uh, living room, a staff dining room, and this is a sports field for the politicians, and there's their courtyard. And then as they are, they are driven off here, dropped on their grass, glass um, canopy, and then when they go for a, an official dinner, this is the official house, and this is the prime minister's house himself. Um, an aerial view of the same uh, project. And this is the tennis court. And this is many, when I did this, which was five years ago, people thought this must be a new tennis game. And um, it is not. It's really that uh, through drawing, you can, you can show uh, certain temperaments uh, of the scheme. This is the kind of really the tennis court under the detention of its players. Another project which, was, which really came straight after the uh, Irish Prime Minister's house, which, which is a conversion in London. And um, we, uh, first thing we did, we demolished all the interior. And um, two years later, I decided not, not to do the scheme because I had a row with a client. And basically, this, the house was um, one of these Belgravian houses which looked very grand, but actually they were done like stage sets. And um, they were very badly built, and in the 60s, when the planning laws were not so stringent, they put additions at the back of these houses. And um, so the middle part, which was, was always like in limbo, and this is a house which is seen as kind of a landscape for uh, architectures, and it's separated into three towers, one which is the most flamboyant, and it's the original size of the rooms, uh, which are painted in most kind of violent colors. The middle part, which is uh, the new part but it's uh, part of the old pieces in it, which is where the dining room is, and the uh, library above, and uh, at the back is the most clinical, and it's all black and white, which are all the uh, kind of uh, health facilities. <coughs> An aerial view, looking at the top of, these, of this apartment. So the top becomes like a private uh, residence for the owners with a main uh, bedroom. And this, this house, like many houses in England, uh, every room they made into five other rooms uh, because the more rooms there are, the better. And uh, so we had to really remove all the walls. So the top is a gymnasium, there's a library, so every item is minimized, and um, there's a, the main bedroom. And this is showing the whole house on one plane, and the furniture, like architecture, is kind of uh, on that kind of one landscape. So this is the, the dining room, living room, uh, the kitchens and, uh, and mirror image, the top floor, the jacuzzi room, the library, and the master bedroom. So every item became very important to, in terms of uh, design. <coughs> and it was also that, uh, that point became very clear that if you are, the importance of uh, uh, using uh, color and, and architecture, that if you cannot always uh, use uh, real materials, then uh, there was a decision had to be made whether one uh, can uh, either fake them or uh, paint them in any kind of uh, other thing I want. And 
at that point, it became really the most uh, obsessive, fashionable thing to do is to make everything look like something else. So, uh, you know, marbleizing and so on. So it became very clear at that moment that really the useful, uh, the usefulness of color or the use of color in architecture is important because it is uh, one has to understand in terms of how it manipulates the, the building. There's the park of La Villette in Paris. And it was uh, at that point when someone said to me, well, you keep on talking and showing things which really move, but do they really move? So this was a park which is predominantly kinetic, and therefore it's really difficult to uh, show it in, uh, in slides. But um, it was basically kind of uh, territories where certain kind of uh, program of the uh, park is never a kind of constant. So this is the exhibition which is moving, um, restaurants which uh, always move. And the whole of the ground was in mud, except for these elevated uh, green um, platforms which move across the landscape. And people can uh, lease them for the day or for the hour. And they had, had different permutations across the whole of the park. So this is uh, how it sits in, in Paris and uh, showing some of the items which actually move. This is the, one of the picnic rooms, one of these kind of green platforms and the moving restaurants above. And then we go back to uh, the peak again. So as you lift up from the shoreline, which is very dense, as you lift up towards the peak, these uh, kind of um, towers become much more fragmented. So uh, you reach the top when, it's, when the, the side is really very isolated. <clears throat> but it has a direct link to the city because it's very approximate. The distance is not very great. It's, the mountain is actually very steep. And this is uh, the peak itself, which comes in, oops. So there is the first beam, which is the studios, the second beam, which is on two levels, which are uh, more like residential uh, accommodation, which is also like a hotel. And the club facility is in this, uh, in this void, and the top two beams are the penthouses. So this is the first beam, which is, um, so the land has already been excavated. Uh, there's a kind of change in level between the top side and the lower side, which is about 27 meters, which I'm not sure how much that would be in feet. Uh, let's say 90, um, 85. And um, so all that piece of land is kind of being carved out of the mountain. And uh, we decide that the, the three sides have to be amalgamated and that it's not going to be three buildings, but actually one building which uh, would uh, accommodate for all the necessary program in the brief. The, what the re brief required was three separate buildings on three separate sides. So now the, the program has really been uh, rewritten, and the first beam is the studios, which are immersed into the ground. It has the edge of the site, and it's the edge of the cliff, which, so you have a drop towards the uh, Hong Kong. There's another edge of the site, and this is one more, which is where the, this is being all carved out. So these are the studios. The first beam, where the studios are above it, rests the second beam, which is also forms the deck level, which are the 22 apartments uh, for the uh, more like residents of the hotel. They are kind of fragments of the site. This is an, one side boundary, another side boundary. This is kind of uh, all the cliff. There is only one piece of land which we could not build on, which was the, what they call the crowd land. We can only bridge over that. Uh, more detailed kind of plans of the, some of these um, studios, which wanted kind of flex, much more flexibility so that uh, they could be either linked vertically or horizontally. They could become other duplexes or um, much bigger apartments. So this is the first beam, sit immersed under the ground. The second beam, which is the deck level. And this is the uh, exercise pool. And this really becomes kind of the landscape for the, uh, for the club, which is uh, uh, basically open all the time. 
This is magic. It doesn't, I don't have to do anything to it. So this is all excavated. This is the new road which links it to the, um, to the mountain. The first beam, the second beam, the pool, and this is what uh, we call the Mad Main Mountain, which has all the indoor activities of the club and all the more uh, kind of uh, hedonistic activities of the club. These are the, uh, which all the kind of floating, uh, more like kind of diving boards uh, within the void. The void is about five stories high and has, as I said, the main program of the club itself. Again, we are still in the void. This is the base of the void, um, the base of the ram. These are very early sketches the pool with the dressing rooms and the library and all the indoor facilities which are the squash courts, the hot pools and so on. The one of the top uh, beam which rests on the top side. So this is where the, where the existing site is. One, two, three sites which have been all uh, amalgamated. The black is the uh, crown land and this has all been uh, carved out the granite clad this building, which is the Man Man Mountain. This is the penthouses, which are more like patio houses, which covers that void. So the, the void is, is, is not uh, only open on all sides, but it's actually covered by the top beam. The deck and the air, which becomes kind of a lobby for these penthouses. So you arrive on the top side and you walk over here. You either go up or you go down to these uh, two beams. the last of the beams. So this, this is how they really, these plates or uh, beams sit on top of one another. And this is the top of uh, one, which is the, uh, again, a series of uh, 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 penthouses. And the penthouses are no longer stacked, but they actually sit next to one another. And right at the top is kind of a communal deck, which, are, which is one communal room, which is a living room, and one communal dining room. And this is accessible from the top side. So this is how they, all these beams kind of sit together. This is the top side, and this is the, the last of the beams, the one below it, and how they kind of really all pivot around this point, and this is the crown land. The black is the man man mountain, and this is all uh, excavated. And this is a composite of all these um, really floating pieces within the, the building. So this is kind of uh, the modern geology all the parts of the building which are, which replace the old land. Uh, the site plan, this shows uh, the new, which is, these are kind of uh, competition drawings showing the, uh, the new road system. This is part, became a kind of a new road which goes through the building, which is over here. And then there was this kind of a series of drawings which were done to really tell how this kind of uh, building came about. So this is uh, the Hong Kong uh, mountain and it's kind of been uh, attacked by these uh, beams. And uh, simultaneously uh, they are attacked also by a program which comes from a very uh, urban condition which are all these kind of living accommodation which do not relate to kind of a countryside uh, like uh, activity which is really more to do with living in the city. And as these beams uh, kind of attack the land, this is while it's being uh, really formed, and this is how it's uh, finally, as before, it's actually uh, anchored. The interiors of these uh, beams, so they go from the base, which is more uh, cellular, it's also built that way, so they are more cellular accommodation at the base, and uh, within the um, the void itself, as you lift up, it's much more uh, fragmented and they are really all like uh, floating uh, between the, in the five uh, levels. And the last two beams are much more uh, uh, fluid so, because also the, the way they are made are kind of like beam uh, bridge construction. So this is why the, kind of the building is uh, being made on the uh, mountain while they has been excavated. 
the top two penthouses. And this is kind of the deck in the air with the paraboloids over the communal rooms uh, at the top. And this is the building as it's kind of forming with the, all the beams before it's really anchored to the land because the road is, uh, is not yet there. So this is kind of, in a way, as it's more or less settled. This is the edge of the site, the first beam, the second one, which is on two levels, which is uh, the apartments, the studios, and this is the, the void. This is all the kind of reading uh, facilities, which is to do with the, uh, you know, relaxing platforms, the library, and more reading related to the pool, the exercise pool. So as you arrive, you drive through here, you go inside the building to park, and you, or you're dropped off at this kind of open air lobby, you either take a ramp which is enclosed to go to the uh, man-made mountain, which is over here, or you take another one to take you to this platform. And these are uh, the top two penthouses. Looking at it from above, this is kind of one of the working models we did for the uh, project. So this shows the kind of uh, the, the area which has really all been uh, excavated the man-made mountain where the restaurants are, the sunbathing decks and the pool and all the reading platforms. And at this point on the, uh, on the side is the place where you can see both sides of the island. So at this point you can see the Hong Kong Harbor and Aberdeen. Uh, composite of the plans. And uh, that's what uh, really freaked most people out because this was the, one of the competition entries. Uh, kind of, uh, so this is the studios on two levels because they are sunk onto the ground but this one room and again within the studios it's divided vertically with these again platforms which become other uh, where the bed is or the uh, dining areas are and these are accessible from the ground from the courtyard the second level which are the two uh, floors of uh, and the second beam which is uh, all rooms with kind of service apartments uh, serviced by the hotel. And there's all the levels of the club from the base uh, of the deck, which is the roof of that, to the second level where the swimming pool is. And the top one is actually where you arrive. So you arrive at this uh, point and either you drive off to the parking, which is in the mountain, or you go into the par other parts. And these are the first beam of penthouses, the open deck, which is where the lobbies are, and the last beam of penthouses. So this is kind of the, this permanent void. This is the only part where the, actually the club exists. Below is uh, more like hotel, accommodation above is uh, residential, and this is the only pub, uh, public part. Over here it's always exposed to the air, and over here it's always enclosed. Showing the library and some of this kind of vertical animals which eventually became supports of the uh, top two beams and the, the base, which is much more basic in terms of construction than the last two. And then I'll go through these um, really early sketches and also um, the more descriptive drawing of the, of the project, which is more like kind of traveling through it. So this is uh, uh, the project in kind of formation before it really became uh, formulated. Um, another kind of uh, emphasis which was put on the brief was that uh, the most magnificent view over Hong Kong. And uh, it is uh, very beautiful, but six months of the year th there is no view because this building is pr in permanent fog. So it became very apparent that um, if anybody is going to go up there for a view, uh, that what became important is that what is immediate to you becomes, your own, becomes the landscape. So it became also apparent that the void itself is the new landscape, and each element of these kind of things which float within it have a very important way they are actually uh, lit and also um, constructed. This is looking at it at night, and this is how you approach it. The open air uh, uh, lobby with two lifts, which takes you, which connects the building together. So 
this is the same drawing but showing the colors of the building in a different time of the day. Again, it became apparent that this building does not have to be cladded, that we would use a, like a, a kind of a resin, which is more like a, a lacquer, because these buildings decay a great deal because of humidity. So all the horizontal surfaces are actually uh, cladded with or used for with real materials, and everything else is uh, painted synthetically with kind of a new resin. This is the, um, the library. So as you drive through, you see the library and these uh, separate platforms. There's very early sketches. Looking at it from the courtyard, so this is the part which is excavated, which forms this courtyard, and there's a service road which takes you to a, a service building, which is part of the man made mountain. So the first beam, which is the studios, as I said, it immersed into the ground, and this is you can enter it from this level, and these are the separate, and this is the the club which is in the void. And then um, after all these, uh, we decided to test it on the computer. And this is really done also for specifically to see how, how, how you would see it or you would uh, perceive it as you actually travel through it. So this is as you approach the building from the existing road. And as you go through the building, approaching the, uh, the lobbies, which are over here, this is the library, the reading platforms, and this is kind of a ramp which connects it to the lobby. So this is where you actually get off or you're dropped off in the car, then carries on. And as you, you either <coughs> leave the building or you go to the car park, and if you were to look back just before you leave the building, this is the the pool and the, the edge of the sunbathing decks. So this is the plan actually where the lobby is. This is the part of the road, uh, the entrance with the lifts and the stairs which connect the whole building together and only these, one of them is actually stops halfway through the void and the other one stops at the top, not the top being the one, the first beam. The enclosed ramp which goes into the dining hall which are in this building and this is the other ramp, which is more like a, a wet ramp. So for those who are using the club facility, uh, roof lights over the dressing area for the lab pool. And then there are a series of these kind of like dining boards, which are either for drinking or eating, which are suspended in the void. So these are kind of a series of studies of all these kind of, uh, all these areas, the lobby itself. A section through it, so this shows the li one of the lift shafts, which actually becomes a supporting uh, uh, secondary support to the uh, top two beams. The ramp, which goes into the inside of the uh, man-made mountain, the lower two beams and the top two beams, and the second uh, lift over there. And this is uh, the the library and the uh, kind of exercise and and reading platforms. This is kind of a, a model which we did for an exhibition of the A a year ago, a tramloid, of, as if we, one is standing in the void looking towards the library and the, uh, the platforms. So this is, again, if you are in the lobby itself, in the open air uh, deck, and about to take this other route to go to the, this part of the building which are where the more main uh, uh, vertical structure is. So this is as you approach the top uh, of the platforms. And if you are on the platform looking towards the void, and the, uh, this is the restaurants, this is the, all the kind of uh, exercise area and the sunbathing decks and the lab pool. So the lab pool is really actually straddling between the one of the uh, 
the top deck and the Malbin Mountain. And if you go to the roof of the library, again, you become closer uh, to the uh, pool itself, but this is where they kind of all the cars um, uh, drive. The interiors of these kind of, uh, the second beam, so these are more like kind of hotel rooms, which are much more cellular, and all the horizontal surfaces, which act as a composite of this uh, void, which are to do with all these kind of series of uh, dabbing boards. The shelves of the library, the floor of the library, uh, the kind of uh, more like a wetter a reading area for the swimming pool, and uh, a more kind of uh, restful area at the top. This is uh, the ramp which connects you to the entrance, a diving board for the swimming pool. And these are all the different, uh, in a way, suites for this uh, second beam. So now you are going into the library, looking towards the top two beams. This is kind of it's on its edge, one of the vertical supports, the edge of one of the platforms. And this is as, as this road goes into the mount, out of the building and into the mountain. As you are in the library, so the kind of the ruggedness of the landscape uh, versus the kind of the, uh, sur the, the polished surfaces of the ground, of the floor in these, um, sort of these rooms. The divers, as you are looking up the, uh, um, I think they could not possibly dive actually on that building. They would most probably fly horizontally to us somewhere else. But um, I was warned that uh, they have horizontal rain in Hong Kong and it's going to be dangerous. But they might still dive. Below the, um, the lab pool, which is inside the man made mountain, are really where all the health facilities are. So this is kind of one of the hot pools. And this is the, the roof of that. Uh, this becomes the kind of uh, the, the dining halls. This, the roof of the, uh, this pool becomes the dance floor, and this is the swimming pool. So this is the plan of this. So this is another of the beams, but a smaller beam which straddles between the deck and the Madman Mountain and goes through it. These are all these kind of uh, interior facilities of the, uh, the gymnasium, the sunbathing decks, the squash courts, which are actually cut into the mountain, and the hot pool and all the kind of massage rooms. Um, inside the um, hot pool, so this is the roof of that pool, which is also a dance floor and the squash court at the back. So this is basically the Mad Maid Mountain with the hot pool, the dressing rooms, which are inside that beam of uh, the uh, lab pool, the exercise hall, all the cellular accommodation, which is uh, the uh, massage rooms, and this is kind of right next to the um, kitchen. Uh, in the deck, the, the doors toward to the dressing areas, and again, one of these uh, cafeterias, which actually float over the pool itself, and the ramp, which are here, and the two beams above. Uh, another of the computer drawings is as you go into up towards the pool as before you jump into it. And this is the view, if you are in the, inside the building looking with uh, fog or no fog, um, the pool, the library, and this is, becomes really your immediate landscape. And if you are swimming on your back looking up, if you want to look up, this is what you would see. So again, the same situation of the lobby is the pool. This is just to orient it one again, how they kind of really coincide. This is kind of where they, they are. So basically, there are three parts of the building which things coincide. This is one, which is where the lobbies are. So there's a section through the uh, man-made mountain. Unfortunately, it's a bit faint, but this is uh, the curtain wall, which is agitated of the uh, uh, restaurants. This is the cage where these cars uh, drive through. So this is part of the reception area. So inside this, uh, these restaurants, actually, the ramp becomes a, a cage for these cars. And this is where you would be drinking, most probably. And this is the health facility, which is the hot pool. 
and this is the best part of the of the void. Another section which shows uh, that the lower two beams or plates are really cellular. This is the void for these uh, ramps and the top two penthouses. The studios of the, uh, all the uh, plans of the studios are really each different. So there's kind of maximum uh, permutations of uh, a studio accommodation. These are the studios in kind of in terms of interior. So the division which is between them is always constant and each of them changes. So these are kind of, again, part of these kind of endless uh, horizontal services which uh, service different parts of the building. Uh, the second beam. So our basic plan is basically the kind of sm very small kitchens, pantries, which are serviced by the hotel. And it's, again, one room with a bedroom over here. So they, some of them are, uh, could be uh, opened up to make into a much bigger apartment. And this is where this second beam sits on top of these uh, studios and how these coincide with them. Another section at that edge of the building, which is the second, not the man-made mountain, but the other side, the top beam, one of the vertical supports, the platform, one of the platforms, the library, the lower platform, and the, the lower two beams, one on two floors and the one below. This is the ramp which goes through the building, and this is the edge of the excavated piece of land. This is the kind of the whole uh, image. Uh, uh, in one, so it shows the uh, base, which is all the studios, kind of uh, the second beam is really like a ghost, the, um, the pool, the library, and the top um, two beams, this is where the kind of the, air, the deck and the air is, and that's where you would see both sides of the iron if you stand there, and the paraboloid over the, um, the communal living room. So as you move towards the top of the top side, this is there where the peak is, and this is the uh, top uh, two penthouses which are approached uh, separately. The um, open air deck, which is the street in the air with the lobbies which take you either to your flat above or below. This is the edge of the man-made mountain. And uh, this is a pool, basically it looks like one pool, but there's actually two pools which are more private. So in essence, the top two penthouses are really the two beams are separate from the rest of the club and it could be approached totally separately, but they are linked if they want to to the club facility. The interior of all these penthouses are kind of painted in the most uh, violent uh, colors. Uh, this is where, uh, the place where the kind of communal living room is, which rests just over this. So at this part of this one flat, it uh, kind of becomes a double height space, the staircase which takes you to this last of the decks, which is on the top. This is exactly where this is. This is right below it. And this is where these, the, um, all the kind of lobbies are. So the lobbies are right in the middle of these two top uh, penthouses. This is the deck in the, uh, in the air, so this is one of the patios and one of the lobbies which takes you to the penthouses below. This is the other beam, so this is as it rests on the land, the base of the swimming pool and these kind of very flamboyant and uh, violent colored uh, uh, spaces. This is the void over the crown nine, which we could not build on, but now it's uh, really carved out of the beam and uh, it's where the two beams actually interlock. So this is kind of this uh, void over the crown line, so it's bridged on both sides.
So this is the kind of edge of the, um, of the top beam as it rests on the land. So the rest is really uh, sits in a series of uh, plates in the excavated land, and only the top one, which is this one, rests on the existing kind of landscape and only linked to uh, below by a kind of a private lift. And um, this is the top, the last swing pool. So if you are um, swimming to the edge, you see the mountains in Hong Kong. The paraboloids as they are uh, formulating. And this is the hall. So this is kind of uh, the interior of this uh, flat becomes a part of the outside and the mountain really cascades to its edge. And this is um, a catalog of all the projects, which is we call the world, which has the Irish Prime Minister's house, the Malevich, the uh, parliaments in The Hague, La Villette, 59 Eaton Place, and uh, finally the peak on its horizon. Thank you. Uh, the contract is evaporated. Thank you. Sorry. Pardon? Oh, well, I don't know. I think they would be the only ones that would be, would, would might be possible for them to be involved. But I don't think that uh, at this moment in time, a kind of a communist uh, government would be uh, interested to take part in a, in a gentleman's club. <laughs> no, no, a lot, of the, a lot of the drawings actually were done afterwards. Uh, they kept all the originals. Uh, it was part of that. But we, we, there was a six basic drawings and also a report which had a lot of these uh, perspectives in them and uh, descriptions. I designed two, in two dimensions. Uh, I don't actually design in two dimensions. I mean, I don't know, maybe I have a very warped vision, but uh, it's not two dimensional. difficult for people to understand them. No, I mean, I think that in a sense, a lot of the, a lot of the drawings are deliberately done kind of in a, not obscure, but because I think that uh, we invented uh, a way of presentation which ultimately has uh, limited us. And I think that not, what people think is they, you can't understand it because they're not really drawings of architecture, but, but uh, I think they are. I mean, we invented how to present architecture, so I think we can reinvent that, too. And also, I think the drawings were always done as really tests of how certain things look like in different, um, you know, views. Well, I think for me, the purpose of the rendering is to myself. I mean, I, I don't think it's to, only to communicate. I think ultimately is, is yourself is going to learn from most from it, and if others can, then fine. But I don't think you can always assume that you're going to teach the world how to understand your drawing. 